is it's going through all sorts of examples of faith. People who had faith. Um, a whole stack of them. Uh, and then in Hebrews 12, which will be Tom speaking next week, they are then referred to as the great cloud of witnesses. And in one particular example that I want to touch on tonight is a guy called Abraham. And in verse 8 it says, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even, if he, even though he didn't know where he was going. Then later in verse 17 it says, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. A number of years ago, um, not long after Nerida and I got married, we had moved into this little, this little unit. Anyway, one day we went out and I don't think we went out for lunch or maybe do some shopping or something like that. We got home and we realised, I looked at Nerida and I said, honey, um, I haven't got the keys, have you got the keys? And she's, she's rummaging through, through her bag and stuff like that and pulls out like about 25 different things um, in the car and she says, no, I, I haven't, got the, haven't got the keys. And so I'm like, okay, so neither of us have, have got the keys. There's stuff everywhere. And so we go, okay, what are we gonna do? Should we contact the, the landlord or should we, you know, try and break in maybe? Anyway, so that's what we went with. We tried, we broke in. So anyway, how we did it was we went around with, which, we said, let's see if we can break in. Let's see if there's a, you know, is, is a window open? Is there a door that we've left open? And you're hoping that you didn't, because if you've left a door open or a window open, you're just inviting someone to break in. You didn't realise it was actually going to be you. So anyway, we're going around and sort of, we, we went around one side of the unit, and lo and behold, the, the window in the bathroom, the bathroom was a little bit open. Okay, now what we're talking about here is it's quite high up and it's quite small. Right? You know those little bathroom in windows things? Okay, they're not built to put a person through. That's not what they were thinking when they built the window. They weren't thinking, we better get the size right for a person to go through here because at some point someone's probably going to need to go through here because they've locked, their, they've locked themselves out. Idiots forgot their keys, they didn't know what they were doing, and they've got to get in. So what happened was, I said to Nero and I looked at each other. I said to her, Nero, I said, honey, reality is, you've got more chance of fitting through the window than I do. She said, okay, all right. She said, we're just not long married, right? So she's like, putting her hands in the life of her husband, which I think there's very little chance she would do now. But at that point, she agreed to do it. So I kneeled down like this and started to lift Nero up. Like this is, you know, I was just, okay. Been, been, had been working out quite a bit at that stage. And, uh, and so I lifted her up, right? And I'm thinking, my goodness, I hope no one comes and sees us, all right? Next minute, so Nero has opened it up and she's pulled the thing back and knocked that in the little screen thing, next minute, that's what happens. The guy from next door pokes his head out. It's like, what's going on? I'm like, it's all right. We live here. We just locked ourselves out. Okay, no worries. Anyway, um, so Nerida's now gotten up and she's halfway in, okay? She's reached the point of no return. <laughs> you cannot come back from being halfway into a toilet um, window, okay? But the thing is, imagine she's inside, she, there's no way for her to put her hands. She's not like, oh yeah, I've got, I've held the, I've got a hold of the thing that you, you grab onto when you're going through the window to get into your house. It's not there. They don't put that in. So I say to her, okay, so I'm thinking, well, when do I let go of her? Because 
Because when I obviously let go of her, she's got, I don't know, a distance of maybe this high to go to the ground. And there's a toilet probably somewhere in between that as well. So anyway, um, she's like, no, no, no. She's like, was so funny because she's like, no, don't let go of me, don't let go of me. I'm like, at some point I'm going to have to let go of you because I can't now pull you out. And she goes, okay. And I'm like, are you sure? She's like, no, don't let go. So eventually I had to let go. I had to let go of her. And so I let go of her. I hear this massive thud. And then a couple of minutes later, she's, she's at the front door. Um, she's letting me in. That, for me, but also for Nerida, was a, an exercise of faith. Letting go when there's nothing there that you can see to grab onto is a, is a definite exercise of faith. A situation where you've got to trust that even though you don't know what's going to happen, that you're going to be, going to be okay. And so I want to look at that with you. Just for a few minutes, the whole idea of faith. Putting our trust and our faith in Jesus, what does that look like? In Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Faith, then, is a gift that God gives us because he has saved us by grace. It's God's grace that saves us, not our faith. It's His grace. His grace comes first. But God gives us His gift of faith, faith so that through faith and trust, our coming into Christ, our coming into Jesus Christ, literally brings us into a right relationship with God. And Romans 5 says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith. Access by faith into His grace. Can you see the way this, all this is beautifully mixed together? In which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Beautiful passage. How do we experience and express our faith? That's what I want to really drive home tonight. How do we experience and express our faith in Jesus Christ? In a world that's overshadowed with doubt. And uh, how do we put our faith into action? In a world where there's so much confusion. There's, you know, love and compassion is lost on, on personal opinion. I need to be right. How do we put our faith into action when when our entertainment overload drowns out God's voice? How do we hear Him in the busyness that invades our personal connection with Him and our relational capacity with, with others? When stress so often robs us of peace and purpose, when people are running around exhausted, uh, burnt out and feeling hopeless. How do we as believers put our faith on, in, you know, on the ground into, into our lives in a real way? So there's not just, not just a verbal affirmation of, of God, but it's a real translation into a, a living and breathing faith. How do we anticipate the presence of Jesus in our lives every day? How does our faith intersect with our hectic daily lives? And we're so busy going from, from, from task to task and thing to thing. What about when things don't go well in our lives? What do we do when stuff goes wrong? How do we press on? How do we continue in faith in those situations? Where do we see Jesus showing up? I want to suggest that we, we look for Jesus working first in the, the little things. Just the daily little things that happen. Sometimes we wonder, where is God leading me? What's, what's God saying? What's the, the big picture that God has for my life? What's the purpose and the plan? And we overlook the little things, the daily interactions with people where our faith 
can be expressed and experienced. Some small spiritual battle, some small spiritual or relational progress. A text from a friend may be saying they're, they're thinking of you, an invitation to coffee, perhaps. Something like that. See, experience and expressing our faith isn't always in the big things. The writing isn't always on the wall. But that's what we tend to look for, for some reason. For God's explicit, overt affirmation of what it is that we're doing. Is this the right thing? Instead of looking at the, the small things. It's not usually a literal tap on our shoulder. And yet, God is always working. The Holy Spirit is always moving. He's always looking to move us into situations where our witness can be made real for Him, for His glory, for His purposes. Where our God story can attach itself to someone else's heart. And so often we don't realise that that's even happening. Maybe through a conversation with a friend or a work colleague. What do we do in that situation? How do we, how do we express our faith to someone who doesn't know Jesus? Do we invite them to church? Like, is that the first thing we should do? Do we invite them to an event? Maybe. Do we invite them to a, a group, a small group? Carl Vader suggests a powerful principle when he says that, that we should consider inviting someone to church only after we've first invited them to our home. Only after we've first invited them. Why is that? Because relationship precedes invitation. People want to know us. They want to know who, who we are. Let's pull back for a second to the example of Abraham and dive a little bit deeper into Hebrews 11. And then we're going to move back into Genesis 22 and pick up that story. This is a striking example of faith. But I believe that even though this is, this is kind of like mega faith, there's some really important principles we can take and use on a daily basis. So I want you to imagine for a minute that you're asked to sacrifice the very thing that means the absolute most to you. Whatever that is. I don't know what that might be. Imagine that for a second. One day, this happened to Abraham, as God called him to sacrifice his only son. Called him to do something so bizarre and so left field that it must have taken Abraham by surprise, like a smack in the mouth. God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. So what does Abraham do? How does he respond? Is he like, are you serious, God? I mean, really sacrifice my only son? Seriously? Did Abraham say something like, God, look, here's the deal. Okay, all right. I hear you speaking to me, but I'll do anything. I'll do anything you ask me to do except for that. Please don't ask me to sacrifice my only son. Come on. Did Abraham, um, did, 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 did Abraham say, look, just leave Isaac alone and just we can work something else out? Here's what, here's what Abraham did. Here's what real faith looks like. And I want to paint the picture and then pull out some principles that I think we can use every day now in our faith journey with Christ. Real total surrender and real trust. Here's what it looks like. Abraham gets up, loads up his donkey, and he and Isaac and two of his servants head out. Where are they going? As Abraham is setting up things for the burnt offering, he places the wood for the fire on Isaac. What's Abraham doing? He's obeying. He's obeying God. It's obeying him. It's so much what God is asking Abraham to do. Not so much that, but it's about Abraham's unquestioning response to God. Not about blind faith, but about total trust and belief in God. Obedience 
precedes understanding. Abraham had no idea. He's like, what? What the heck? Why would God, a loving God, ask me to sacrifice my own son? Obedience precedes understanding. Sometimes we hear ourselves saying, but I just, I don't understand. I don't understand what God is saying. I don't understand what, what God is doing. See, understanding is never a prerequisite for obedience. Faith is stepping forward even when we don't have all the bits, all the pieces, all the answers. Faith is obeying the light that's been revealed to us before we expect God to reveal more light. It's about honouring God and doing what the principles in the Bible lay down for us, even when it is hard. Imagine Isaac thinking for a minute, what the heck is going on here? Has my dad gone completely mad? What is he doing? And here's what happens. Here's what, how Isaac responds. He says to Abraham, he says, Hey, Dad, I've noticed something weird here. The fire and the wood are all here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? So it would have been used to setting up this whole situation before, and there would have been a lamb there ready for the burnt offering. And Isaac's going, hang on, he's starting to put the wood on me, and there's no lamb. The wood for the fire is ready, but what's the story? Something's missing. Abraham doesn't say, to, to his son Isaac, he doesn't say, I'm sorry son, but God has asked me to sacrifice you this time. He doesn't do that. He, he, he doesn't say, I know it sounds odd, it's a bit of a raw deal, but God, when God tells you to do something, you just got to do it. He doesn't say that to, to Isaac. He says this, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Isaac's like, where's the lamb? God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Saving faith always starts with Jesus, not us. Now I want you to notice something so powerful here. Right here in this little exchange. In the King James Version, it says, so, so right there in the NIV, it says God himself, right? God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. But in the King James, it says this, God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering. Just, just pause with me for a minute, okay? In the, new, in the NIV, it's God himself will provide. But if you look back and just look at a slightly different translation, it opens up something so powerful that it just blows your mind. It says, it says God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering. You see, in John 1, 29, it says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God will provide himself the sacrifice for sin. He provided his own son. So here's a picture of the sacrifice that took place on the cross way back all those years ago with Abraham as God called him to sacrifice his own son. And when Isaac asks, where's the lamb? Abraham says, God will provide himself. I want you to, to just... Look ahead to the cross for a minute with that story in mind. Look to the cross. It's so powerful, that image. God will provide himself, and that's exactly what he did. Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, who gave his life on the cross to take away our sin. Next, Abraham binds Isaac to the altar ready to sacrifice him as God has commanded. What is he doing? What's Abraham doing here? Is he just blindly complying with a ridiculous, far out, crazy request that no one should be expected to, to comply with? Not even from God? Surely, surely God's either lost it or he's joking, right? Neither is the case. 
Abraham reaches out his hand to take the knife to slay his son. What on earth is going through his mind right now? He reaches out, he takes the knife, he's thinking, am I really doing this? Am I really about to kill my other son? And just as he starts, he's got the knife, and just as he starts the downward movement, all of a sudden an angel interrupts him and calls Abraham, Abraham. And he says, yes. Imagine the relief in his heart, in his mind, when the angel calls to him and he says, yes. He replies with a massive sigh of relief. Do not lay a hand on the boy, said the angel. Now I know that you fear God. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your only son. Then what happens next is Abraham looks up and all of a sudden he sees a ram caught in a bush. God has delivered on his promise. God has provided the sacrifice. In Deuteronomy 7, 9, it says this, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. He's a faithful, covenant-keeping God whose love is steadfast and unshakable. Wow. That word steadfast, what that means is it's unwavering, unshakable, unfaltering, persistent, and committed. God's character is that he's steadfastly committed to his promises. Psalm 51, 10 paints a picture of our response to that steadfastness. It says this, Create in me a pure heart and and renew a steadfast spirit in me. When I waver, bring me back, God. When I get off the path, bring me back. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. Abraham had a steadfast spirit because his faith was firmly planted in the living God. His confidence was completely in the Lord. See, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is confidence. What does that mean? Confidence. The word confidence is, it, it has this whole idea of substance. It has this whole, whole idea of material or matter or an element. So then our faith is, is like the, the elements, the material of unseen things. Our faith is the material of, an, of unseen things. That's what our faith is. We have confidence. We have this assurance in and through Christ. It means we can say, I'm confident in my Saviour. I am assured in my Lord. Faith is confidence in what we hope for, it says next. In what we hope for. What do we hope for in our lives every day? What do we hope for? That things will be better, maybe? Things will be different. The things will be clearer. In Christ, we have a confident hope. And the hope is secured because it's founded in Jesus and what he did on the cross, his finished work on the cross. Our hope is not a fleeting desire, it's a firm, solid, and secure hope. In Hebrews 6:19, it says, And we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. Firm and secure. I remember camping, going camping as a kid. And we had, my dad had this massive, old, huge, grey tent. And it was massive and it was square. And in the middle of it, it had this massive pole. And it felt like as a kid, when I was a kid, that the pole went like into the sky and never ended. And one day we, one day we went camping, packed up all the stuff into the trailer and off we go. And we're setting up the tent. My dad, I don't know what it is with dads of that generation, but they had this, it, everything had to be perfect. You know, like when I'm at home, when, I, when we go to camp, we set up the tent, right? It's just like, bang, 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 yeah, it's in. It's all right, you know, just, yeah, but, the, 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 but the, pop, the rope's not tight enough. Yeah, but it's fine, it'll be fine. But my dad wasn't like that. He had all the bits sorted out ready to put into place. As soon as the tent went up and the poles were up, all the thing, and it was just perfect, totally secure. But one day, 
Here we were on this camping adventure, and all of a sudden this storm, I'm talking massive storm hit, like this full blizzard thing, almost like a tsunami. No, it wasn't a tsunami, but it was a full blizzard. Anyway, it hit and it started raining. So we all go into inside the tent, and it's raining and raining and raining, full bore rain, like really hard. Next minute, the tent starts to leak. Okay? I'm like, Dad, what's up with it? Your tent is leaking. So next we were all piled into the car. And we're all sitting there, shivering and shaking, cold, because it's just we're all drenched. And next minute the wind starts to come up. And all of a sudden, the, the ropes start to lift up. The hooks start, you know, flying all around. There's this full blizzard, and I'm thinking, the tent's about to like fully fly away. So we had to literally, my dad's like, okay, boys, hop out of the car. We had to literally hop out of the car, pack up the tent, because now the river that we were tent where we were actually camping beside is starting to rise. It's like, whoa, that we did not see that coming. So we had to pack up in the middle of you know of this storm, chuck the tent in the back, and get out as soon as we can because because we, there was a road that was threatening to, to flood. So we get all that done, massive winds, you know, massive water, tent coming up out of the ground, chuck it in the trailer, and, and, and off we go. We thought that tent was as secure as it could be, but it wasn't. But our hope in Jesus is totally secure. The tent lines will never come unstuck. Ever. And that's something we never have to doubt. Because hope in Jesus Christ is unshakable. It doesn't matter what storms life throws at us. It cannot be moved. It cannot be broken. It cannot be stored or weakened. Unshakable faith promotes unquestioning obedience. And that's what Abraham did. You see, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So how can you believe in a God that you can't see? How can you believe that stuff? That's crazy. Where's the evidence? Come on. Your faith is confident assurance. And next we find that faith is tied to belief. Hebrews 11, 6 says, And without faith, it's impossible to please God. But anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. See, belief that God exists is absolutely vital, but friends, it's only the starting point. Believing in God is only the starting point of our faith journey because James 2 tells us that even demons believe that God exists. As followers of Jesus, first we believe in God's character, that He is who He says He is. Next, we believe in God's promises that He will do what He says He will do. Genuine, authentic faith is demonstrated when we believe that God will fulfill His promises even though we don't have the whole picture. Even though we'd like just a little bit more. God, show me just a little bit more. That's faith. Faith in His promises, even when we don't see that happening. It's confidence, crushing confusion. Dependence, ditching doubt. Trust, piercing panic. And courage, triumphing over fear. So I wanted to ask you this question tonight as we, as we finish. How do we make faith-based decisions in our, in our everyday lives? How does our Faith influences the way we function every day. At work, at home, um, in our finances, in our health, in our relationships, in our, in our service, in our ministry. You see, saving faith is founded on heartfelt repentance and complete trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. It's what He did. He finished the work on the cross. But saving faith produces a heart response of gratitude and thanksgiving when we recognise all that Jesus has done for us. 
and our gratitude produces a willingness to act on our faith. See, James described it like this, James. Faith without works is dead faith. Faith produces a desire, a willingness. It produces a response and action. As, as followers of Jesus, we become action takers. And action, as action takers, we become world changers. Why? How? By obeying the Great Commission to go into the world and make disciples. Go into the world and make disciples of all nations. Prior to that, here's what happens. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. So based on that authority, he calls us to go. He calls us to go and serve people. Serve people. Remember one day, a few uh, years ago, when I was at a previous church, one of the guys in the, in the church called me up one morning. And he said, um, he said, Andrew, um, just been thinking about you. Um, is there anything that I can do to, to serve you today? I said, oh, what do you mean, dude? Like, I don't know. I said, is there anything, just small, something practical that would make a difference for you? And I couldn't think of anything off, off the top of my head other than pay off my mortgage, which I couldn't really ask him for. That's probably a bit bigger than what he was suggesting. But he said, how about I come and wash your car? Fantastic. So he came and got my car, took it away, washed it, and then brought it back. And when he brought it back, looked at the car and I thought, my goodness, he's put on new tyres. I'm like, dude, the tyres, what's the go? They're not my tyres, man. He's like, yeah, they are. I'm like, no, seriously, these tyres were beautiful, shiny, black. I'm just like, man, oh, so you just got, he says, well, I didn't get a, like a spray thing. He said, I painted them. I was like, dude, what do you mean you painted them? Don't you just go into a shop, get one of those spray things that all foams up, and then a couple of minutes later it's nice and shiny and black, isn't it? Oh, he said to me, I think when your tyres are nice and clean and shiny and black, it makes your whole car look nice and clean and shiny. And it did, it looked amazing. These painted black tyres. But just this small way of, of serving someone. And it, and it just gave me such a lift and a boost and I'm wondering where in our lives we can serve someone in a small way just as an example of our faith. Just as a small example of our faith. See, I wonder tonight, does Jesus have part of our lives or does he have all of our lives? You see, do we say, look, Look, Lord, you, you can have this part of my life. That's okay, all right? But this stuff over here, I can handle this myself. Do we say, Lord, you can, you can have that part. I'm happy for you to speak into my life on that, these things. But over here, this is like dangerous territory, okay? It's cruel. I've got that covered. It's too important to let go of or it's too difficult to release or it's too personal to open that door, God. Okay, I've got that. Besides, I've got that. I, I'm, I can take care of that myself. I don't need that stuff to be God's stuff. It's all good. Well, does he have our whole lives? Our whole lives from start to finish, beginning to end. Do we give him bits and pieces? Or do we yield and surrender our whole lives to him? See, Hebrews 11 tells us that by faith, no one built an ark. Hebrews 11 tells us by faith, Abraham obeyed and went even though he had no idea what was going on. Hebrews 11 tells us that by faith, Sarah was able to have children even though she was beyond childbearing age. That by faith, the people passed through the Red Sea. The waters were parted and the people passed through. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. Hebrews tells us of all this stuff that happened by faith. And what we see here is that every faith response is a reacting of the heart, a determination of the will, and a taking of action through faith. Throughout Scripture, we see that people's lives being changed like that. What about us tonight? 
See, there's so much in our world that vies for our faith. It says, look, this is the most important thing. You know, the world wants us to put our faith in, in TV and music stars, or in money, or, 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 or in material possessions, or in sport, or in popularity, or success, or notoriety, or whatever it is. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 27 it says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, the weak things to shame the strong. And Matthew 20 verse 16 says, So the last will be first, and the first will be last. So the world assesses our performance on status and the accolades that we achieve. Whereas Jesus only has one question for us. So I want to leave you with tonight. Jesus only had one question for us. Have you become nothing yet? Because when you become nothing, God can finally do anything through you. That's where he wants us to be. That in and of ourselves, we come and say, Lord, I've got nothing to offer. Nothing. Because everything that I do have that's good comes from you anyway. Lord, and with all that nothing that I've got to offer, I come and I fall on my knees and I surrender to you. Our identity isn't found in anything in this world. It's not found in our skills or our resources or our abilities or our talents or our knowledge or our popularity or our success or our looks. It's not found in any of that. It's found in Jesus Christ. He's the Lord of our lives. He purchased our lives on the altar where he gave his life. I want you to encourage you to take one action step tonight. Write down the name of one person who, in your life, you could pray for every day. One person that you would be able to say, Lord, take my faith and use me in whatever way you see fit to, to, to love that person, to encourage that person to come closer to you. It might just be one, one small step. But if you, we pray for that one person, who knows what it is that God can do? Because once we start praying for that person, we then start to look for opportunities and we become available to that person. And if that person is seeking, we become available as God's resource, as God's hand and feet in that situation, in that person's life. So I encourage you to do that. Write down one person's name and say, say to the Lord, Lord, in my nothingness that I've got to offer, in my surrender to you, in my faith that you've given me as a gift, Lord, I pray for that person that you would use me in some way to draw them closer to you. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much, Lord, for the gift of faith that we have in and through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of salvation, for the grace that you have shown us. Lord, for the love that you've poured out on the cross for us. Lord, it's not about anything that we've done. It's not about how good we are. Father, you've done everything necessary to take us from where we are and to bring us to you, to draw us to a relationship with you. So that in and through that relationship, Lord, that we would know, even when the stormy sea is hit, that you are faithful, that you are good and that you are there that you care for us and that you will carry us through those stormy seasons in our lives. You will carry us through those difficult, painful, horrible times that we face. And you'll bring us through Lord, as your people, as your children who you love. Thank you for Jesus. Father, we commit ourselves tonight to, to you first and foremost, to each other, in loving and caring and supporting uh, each other as believers, to carry each other's burdens. 
will we still also commit ourselves to that one person. Show us who it is, Lord, that we can come to you and pray for. And ask, Father God, that you would help, help to use our faith story, the grace that you've shown us, to help one person maybe take one small step closer to you. Wouldn't that be an honour to be used in that way? We thank you. Commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name.